What I'd like to do at this point is to introduce our department chair, Professor Gary Harlow, and ask him to make a few remarks. So I'm very pleased that I'm very pleased that all of you have decided to join us this morning. And actually, I'm not going to do very much because we have an outstanding group of faculty who will be here to give you their presentations and their perspective. And maybe even more importantly, we have some very outstanding graduate students who probably know more about the department than the rest of the faculty. So I want to give them the opportunity to uh, try and answer your questions and interact with you. I will just say that if there's something that comes up during the course of this webinar that does not answer your questions, please feel free to email us and we will try and respond as quickly as possible. So with that, I'll turn it back to Professor Rockwell. <clears throat> You're muted, Don. Okay, thanks. I'd first uh, like to call on our graduate coordinator, Allison Marsteller, who does a marvelous job of interacting with our incoming and onboard graduate students. And uh, Allison, would you like to make a few comments now? Sure. Hi, I'm Allie. Um, I coordinate the graduate programs here in mechanical engineering and mechanics at Lehigh University. I look forward to answering any questions you might have. I'm here to assist you with any help you may need. You can always reach me email, you can call me, we can even set up a Zoom if you'd like, whatever's most convenient for you. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Professor Arindam Banerjee is a member of our panel. Professor Banerjee, would you like to make a few remarks? Yeah, so, you know, good morning or good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. Uh, you know, uh, I have been at Lehigh for a little over eight years now. Uh, I'm a professor in this department. Uh, so my background mostly is in experimental fluid mechanics and I teach courses, you know, graduate and undergraduate courses in fluid mechanics and also in renewable energy. You know, I see a lot of my students here, uh, you know, people who I have interacted with as undergraduates and who have, you know, moved into the graduate program. And I, uh, you know, would be willing to answer any types of questions on graduate research that you may have. Thank you, Professor Banerjee. Uh, next, uh, Professor Hannah Daly. Good morning, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time to be here. Um, we're really delighted to see all of you on this webinar. And we know that we probably won't be able to get to all of your questions during the course of our hour together today. But um, just know that all of us who are representing the department, including myself today, are happy to answer your questions. So if you wanna get in touch with us later, that's fine. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in mechanical engineering and I study orthopedic biomechanics. We do a lot of numerical simulation. And I also teach our graduate course in numerical methods, which is a really fun, MATLAB intensive course where we play games and solve puzzles and learn how to make MATLAB serve all of your needs in the rest of the courses you're going to take in the research you do. Thank you, Professor Dan. Now we move to the graduate student panelists. And first, Emma Hillman, would you like to make some remarks? Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Emma, and I'm a current graduate student at Lehigh University. I um, also studied at Lehigh University during my undergraduate years. I studied mechanical engineering and environmental studies. Um, and now during my graduate time here at um, Lehigh through the mechanical engineering department, I'm really trying to focus some of my courses related to um, the energy industry, but there's a wide, uh, wide array of courses that you can um, take through the mechanical engineering department at Lehigh. Thank you, Emma. On Kate Roy. If you'd like to sign in, make a few remarks. Thank you, Professor. Hello, everyone. My name is Ankit. I started the I started my program in fall 2018 as a graduate research assistant. Um, my advisor is Professor Ganesh Bala Subramanian. When I first started, I took a total of five core courses spanning math, manufacturing sciences, and fluid mechanics. And then, as a part of my program, I was able to secure the uh, prestigious Rosen Dean Fellowship 
And in that fellowship, I was given a very advanced teaching training program under um, reputed faculty. And right now I'm currently only involved in research and have been able to get some of my papers published. Um, the training here, the research training here at Lehigh is excellent and will groom you very well for research. Thank you. Thank you, Ankit. Next, uh, Christopher Rule. Thanks, Professor, and thank you all for joining us on this hour. Uh, my name is Chris Rule. I've been at Lehigh for a total of six and a half years, four of which as an undergrad in the mechanical engineering department, a year uh, as a master's student in technical entrepreneurship, which is a specific program uh, here at Lehigh. Uh, and then uh, I returned to Lehigh a year and a half ago to pursue a PhD. Uh, I am working under Dr. Banerjee, who you heard from just a, a minute ago uh, in the area of turbulent flow studies. Uh, in between my master's and PhD, I did work in industry uh, for a little bit. So I have that perspective. I'm sure some of you uh, are experiencing the same thing right now. Um, and I'd be glad to uh, offer any advice that I have based on my time here uh, at Lehigh. Thank you, Chris. Well, now I'd like to move to the brief PowerPoint presentation. And that, of course, will involve doing a screen share. The photograph you see here is of the Packard Laboratory, which is where the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Mechanics is located on the Lehigh campus. Lehigh is located in the northeastern part of the US, in case you're not familiar with that. And the distance to New York City from Lehigh is about 85 miles and from Philadelphia, about 57 miles. So actually many of us uh, frequently travel to both of these cities while we have the pleasure of living in a uh, location where living costs are not so high. I'd like to start off by giving you an overview of the department. And this will be a very brief visit, of course. First of all, say something about the graduate students in the department. We have a total of 120 graduate students 48 MS candidates and 72 PhD candidates. Regarding faculty, we have a total of 26 faculty. And these faculty can be associated with research clusters. These are loosely affiliated research clusters where faculty communicate with each other, join forces to write proposals and other similar projects and endeavors. And these research clusters involve the following areas, controls and robotics, where we have six faculty, fluid mechanics and flow structure interactions, seven faculty, mechanics of materials, six faculty, thermal heat transfer, five faculty, and biomechanics, five faculty. It's important to point out that the research in each of these clusters can be theoretical, it can be computational, it can be experimental, or a combination of two or more of these. If we look at some representative images associated with each research cluster in the field of controls and robotics, we see here a research type drone. This represents only one of the foci of the controls and robotics areas. We have topics such as uh, the control of plasmas in large scale fusion reactors and many other topics in this general category. So the point I want to make, this image represents one of the very thriving research programs in this area, but there are a number of others. And this holds for all of the other research clusters that we're looking at in fluid mechanics and flow structure interactions, research ranging from quiet flight conditions 
to high-speed uh, flow of aircraft. In this area, mechanics of materials, what you see here is a composite high-speed boat that was actually designed and built here at Lehigh. In the area of thermal heat transfer, we see a specimen subjected to basically tension and compression loading while being heated and cooled. In the area of biomechanics, we have two different perpendicular orthogonal views of a bone fracture. Just to point out the experimental facilities, we have 12 research laboratories here at Lehigh. The computational capabilities, as you can see, 4,156 computer cores and a peak performance of 198 teraflops. Point out that we also have interactions and links with 11 national and international laboratories and centers. And these links and interactions have many benefits to the university and to our students, of course. Awards to graduate students and faculty. say something about graduate student awards and recognitions. Graduate students can win on their own fellowships from a variety of sources. You see there, National Science Foundation Graduate Fellowship, Amelia Earhart International Fellowship, International Institute of Education Fellowship. Those are some of the possibilities where we support and help students apply and win these prestigious fellowships. And then this next category, grants and fellowships for national and international research projects and stays at major centers, including the following. And all of the destinations that you see listed here involve active student involvement in proposing a research endeavor at one of these locations. And at all of these locations indicated here, the graduate student actually spent a significant amount of time. And these are just representative of some of our outreach and connected uh, interactions that we have outside of Lehigh. Now, I should point out that I don't have a slide here that shows something that's also very important. And that is graduate students being lead authors on articles that are published in prestigious international journals and also lead authors on papers that are presented at national and international conferences. We feel it is our obligation to put the student up front and to provide as much visibility as possible for the student. One of these articles that I'm referring to involves the student as a leading author with nine other co-authors behind him, some of them from Lehigh and some from a prestigious national laboratory. I think later on today, we will see uh, an example of this point. Well, how about faculty awards? Uh, faculty have received more than 45 awards in recent years for outstanding accomplishments from professional societies and federal agencies. And within this category, a total of 13 prestigious NSF career awards and DOD, that's Department of Defense Young Investigator Awards. And most recent recipients are shown here. There are six photographs. Uh, it's very clear that we are recognized in a national sense as a very strong and continuing to go stronger uh, research and educational uh, university in a national sense. Point out here also the faculty receive awards of highly reset competitive research funding from national agencies, including National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, Department of Energy, Advanced Research Projects Agency, and DOD agencies. So our faculty are continuously involved in interacting with these 
external agencies and writing very substantial research proposals for funding from those agencies. Let me say something next about the PhD degree, the path to the PhD and financial support. In a simplified way, I can describe the path to the PhD as involving the four stages or phases that you see here. The first is completion of coursework. Uh, a minimum of eight courses are required towards the PhD. Next would be formulation of a research proposal. And that involves identification of major unknowns in a new field, then development of proposed research in the format of a leading national agency. And this actually is our general examination. It's quite different than the traditional general exam, which involves a series of written and oral exams on subject matter. We feel this is an opportunity for us to help the student grow into a leadership type role and advocating what needs to be done in emerging fields. And this actually has been very successful. And I might point out that not only for PhD students, but also our master's students, our MS program, this type of approach and uh, attitude really permeates uh, all of our master's program as well. Next would be collaboration on dissertation research. This of course is original new research contributions to your field with guidance from your faculty advisor. And as I suggested earlier, it results in journal publications in high quality journals with a lot of visibility. And last, we have completion of the total credit R requirement. Uh, those details I'm not going to go into right now, but we can basically respond to any questions you might have a little bit later. Now, financial support for PhD students comes in the following forms. We have a presidential or university fellowship and a, another type of fellowship, a Rawson fellowship. With both of these fellowships, there are no obligations associated with the fellowship. Research assistantship, this is research with guidance from a faculty advisor, and the faculty advisor actually provides the funds for this type of assistantship. Teaching assistantship, assistance with teaching a question or teaching a course in collaboration with a faculty instructor. And we find this provides a great opportunity to develop teaching and leadership skills through participation in the teaching practicum program. And then finally to point out that in many cases, a combination of those types of aid is used to fund students. The one thing I'd like to make clear, and that actually is in response to one of the questions that we have, the financial support for a PhD student, no matter what category it is, must go through the faculty member who will be the research advisor of that student during the duration of the PhD. In other words, even though a student would receive financial support from the department or the college for the first year of graduate study, we have to make sure that student is fully funded for years after the first year, for the second, third, fourth year. And that's where the research advisor plays a critical role because the advisor will take on the financial responsibility of funding the student. What this means is that when we talk about a financial support mechanism for the first year of study, of graduate study, that has to go through the faculty member who will be the advisor or the graduate student and making sure that we have continued full support. Now, in that regard, I'll also emphasize that admission to our graduate program and financial support are two different issues. We accept students who we think are highly qualified and will do well in our program, but then they have to identify through consultation with our faculty a research advisor, and that should be done actually before coming to Lehigh. 
We do have some students that prefer to pay their own way for a semester with the hope of uh, getting a research advisor. That sometimes happens, but it's not the recommended process. Say something about the Master of Science program, and this involves multi-track options. So the Master of Science degree, MS degree, involves 10 courses, which is equivalent to 30 credits. And the student selects the preferred track for the MS degree. The first possible track would be a thesis track. And the idea here is to focus on research and the master's thesis, which is part of that research endeavor. Master's thesis is written up in the end and that counts for two courses, in other words, two course equivalents. We have a project track, which can be a focus on design development or applied research and that counts also for two courses. So you will have completed two courses out of the 10 required courses if you go the project track. Another track, applied engineering track, the idea is to focus on deep mechanical engineering and mechanics knowledge base through coursework. In other words, you want to go as deep as you can in some particular area of mechanical engineering. And typically this involves two courses. The interdisciplinary track focus is on development of expertise in another discipline that we call a concentration area. And this is a complement to an MEM core. And this counts for four courses. So the concept here is that you are able to take four courses outside of our department in order to develop expertise in whatever area you would like. And this interdisciplinary track can be designed by the student. We see here a representation of the interdisciplinary track. Over here, we have a uh, core curriculum in the center and within the circle, we have the traditional areas of mechanical engineering, which form the core of the knowledge base. And then around that, we have representations of the so-called concentration areas. So you can see these indicated in the photos as we move around. The font is a little bit small here on this image. So I'll just go over here and talk about the concentration areas. The first one, aerospace, computational mechanics, energy, robotics and automation, management science and engineering, machine learning and data mining, environmental policy, technical entrepreneurship, or a self-designed concentration where the student designs uh, their own interdisciplinary track. In some cases, these courses are taken in another department. For example, management science and engineering, which is a very interesting approach towards management. Uh, that is really taken in the industrial systems engineering department. The machine learning and data mining taken in the computer science department in conjunction typically with the industrial systems engineering, the environmental policy, uh, political science, uh, that is uh, taken actually outside our college. So there are many combinations, many flexibilities, and we find that whatever students want to do, we can design something that satisfies the degree requirements. Say something about a new ranking that just came out in uh, January, uh, the best master's program known as the BPM rankings and Actually, Lehigh was ranked number two um, between Stanford and Purdue for the online master's degree program in mechanical engineering. And the website, uh, in case you want further details, is indicated here. But 
uh, this was done using quantitative measures based on tuition rate, potential salary, and student satisfaction. I'd like to say something next about the destinations of our graduate, that is once they finish their degree programs, what are their typical next steps? And here we have three MS degree recipients. The first one is Durlov Mudbari. He's presently a stress engineer at Gulf Aerospace Systems. He received his MS in 2017. He worked in the research group of Professor Morid, and he did a thesis in the area of aerodynamics. Next, Elana Abrams. She is now a mechanical engineer with Gear 9, which is a product development company, MS degree in 2019. And I remember my conversations with Elena. We had uh, very, I think, informative and helpful interactions that help her determine the courses that she would like to take. And she's very interested in product design, which is an interesting branch of mechanical engineering. The next one shown is Shangxing Yu Lucas Lin. He's now an endurance testing engineer at Daimler Greater China Limited, which is actually the parent company of Mercedes-Benz cars. And he actually received his master's degree at Lehigh in 2014. So these are some of the representative MS degree recipients from Lehigh and their destinations. We have here the representative destinations of both MS and PhD graduates indicated. This is a, a partial list of where our graduates have gone recent years. You can see there's a wide variety of industry, government laboratory, and university destinations indicated there. I'd like to point out that at Lehigh, we have a very active uh, center for career and professional development. The website uh, address is indicated here. You might want to check it out. And the primary contact person there is Ali Eric. She's actually associate director of the entire center, but her focus is on uh, graduate student career development. So at any time, you can contact Ali and chart a path for your career development, uh, which eventually will help you uh, work towards the destination that you're striving for. I'd like to also point out that we have a very active graduate life office at Lehigh, and this is actually located in Packer House, which is about one block away from Packard Lab, which our uh, department is located. And the website address is indicated here. Uh, this slide shows some typical photographs of social events. Uh, social events involve various excursions, as well as events within Packer House. An additional support possibility for students coming in are your fellow students from your home country. And we found that this offers an excellent way of connecting and helping you get started at Lehigh, uh, depending on your home country. But we, of course, do like to see, and we strongly encourage uh, diversity of interaction of all of our students. And finally, I'll say something about admissions, admissions overview. The deadline for consideration of financial support at Lehigh. Sorry, um, lost that slide. So the deadline for consideration of financial support is January 15, that deadline is passed, and that is for the university and college-sponsored uh, financial support. However, 
for the college support, there is still time to apply for that. And also emphasize that for research assistantships with faculty members and support that is not directly connected to the university sources, uh, there is actually no deadline for that. And actually you can apply uh, throughout the spring semester and actually into the summer. However, you do want to keep in mind that the final deadline for fall submission, admission into our graduate program is July 15th. And so that's an important marker date. The GRE is not required for 2021 admission and application waivers are available uh, when you apply through our online system. Any further questions, you can contact uh, Ollie, whom you met at the very beginning. Uh, now for international students, we have some minimum TOEFL and IELTS scores, uh, ITP scores indicated here for your help. Uh, Ollie can provide detailed answers to any of the questions you have on these types of issues. So with that, um, I think we can conclude our PowerPoint presentation and basically return to our live format. And I would like to uh, ask if we have had any questions come in uh, during the um, PowerPoint presentation or the comments before that. So Ali, can you see if there have been any questions submitted uh, during the webinar? And if so, could you please read the first question? No, nothing came in and I just sent out a reminder that if they do have questions to let us know. Okay, very good. So I think one of the uh, questions that was submitted that I didn't get a chance to go into during the um, PowerPoint presentation is financial aid for MS students and whether such aid does exist. Now, I have to point out that Lehigh, as well as other universities that we compete with, they offer standard fellowships and teaching assistantships only to PhD students. The idea is that the university feels it's making a long-term investment with a PhD student. And that is basically the culture that's been established at the top group of universities. However, I will point out that supplemental forms of financial aid are available to MS students. Uh, in some cases, uh, not often, but in some cases, partial research assistantship is available from a faculty member who leads a research group. In other words, if the faculty member feels that you can contribute to the research project while you're doing your MS degree, that faculty member may be able to provide some partial support for that research. Another mechanism is what we call a department graduate assistantship. And that DGA or department graduate assistantship is for your assistance with the teaching in the department. Now, that particular type of assistantship, uh, we have a limited number of those available and the level of remuneration is not high. It's $2,000 for the semester. Nevertheless, students like to participate in that program uh, for developing their teaching and leadership skills. I also mentioned that there are on campus graduate assistantships associated with other branches of the university. For example, the athletics department and the office of student life does have graduate assistantships available. And so that's something that you can check into, but you should not count on that there's not a large number of these types of support available. And then of course, there's a possibility of loans for domestic students through the Office of Financial Aid at Lehigh. So those are just some additional comments I wanted to make. We try to be as helpful as we can to students who are in our MS program and to pursue every possible opportunity we can. Um, I would like to ask uh, if any of the panelists uh, either the faculty panelists or the graduate student panelists have any further remarks on financial aid? I did have one question come in that I'm going to throw out because it's pertaining to what you're talking about. 
um, just to clarify that I'm understanding correctly, there are no MS students serving in TA roles or is a teaching assistantship award separate from this type of part-time hire? Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, what we refer to as a teaching assistant or a teaching assistantship involves a commitment of 10 hours per week assisting a faculty member teaching a course. And for that, the stipend is $2,500 per month. And that is for a full TA. Most of our appointments are for what we call half TAs because we try to help a larger number of students. And so that would be $1,250 per month. And then going with that stipend will be 4.5 tuition credits. So that type of teaching assistantship is available to PhD students. But according to the college policy, um, we cannot offer that type of aid to a master's student. And the form that we can offer to a master's student is the department graduate assistantship that I referred to earlier, which of course doesn't provide the same type of stipend. And we cannot provide tuition help with that department graduate assistantship. Okay, any further comments on financial aid? Anybody? Okay. Well, I think what we can do now is to uh, emphasize once again that if the questions you submitted were not answered during the uh, main part of the uh, PowerPoint presentation, then please let us know by email after the webinar and we will get back to you as soon as possible to give you a detailed answer, okay? So what we can do now is to move to some additional questions that I've actually formulated, which I think will bring out um, our faculty and graduate student involvement. And in the course of these descriptions that are be given by our faculty and graduate students, I think that will answer some of the questions that may have been in the back of your mind regarding our graduate program. So I'd like to actually get started with uh, Professor Daly. And here is the question to get started that I would like to ask her. Um, your entry level graduate level course, ME430, which is called Numerical Methods, and by entry level, I mean that course is accessible to both master's and PhD students during the first fall semester at Lehigh. That course is taken by many students across a variety of sub-disciplines in mechanical engineering. In other words, if you recall the slide that I showed with the various research clusters, basically students from each of those research clusters take this common numerical methods course. So my first question, Professor Daly, is how is the content of this course employed in practical applications? And can you provide some examples? So oh, Professor Daly. Sure. sure, okay. So numerical methods, uh, I love teaching this course because I have a lot of fun um, with numerical methods. My lab does a lot of numerical computing for our research. And it's something that I've always enjoyed since I was an undergraduate student. So I was really excited to have the opportunity to teach this class. I made a couple of slides. So I'm gonna just quick share my screen. Give me a second here. And I wanna show you, cause I think some of it is better um, seen in pictures than in words. So hold on, I need to close my... All right, can you guys see that in full screen, I hope? Okay, so numerical methods is a really broad foundational tool that we use in all of the content area disciplines in mechanical engineering. So whether you're doing um, simulation-based research for your graduate program or whether you're doing experimental work, all of us are gonna need to do something that pertains to data processing or to some kind of simulation at some point during grad school and then beyond. And so the numerical methods course, ME413, is set up to help build important skills that you're gonna need for the other courses in mechanical engineering and for research. 
So I picked a couple of examples of um, projects and puzzles that we've done over the last couple of years in 413. So um, some of my favorites, we solve, we write um, solvers for Sudoku puzzles. We have a challenge where we make computer generated art using um, Newton Raphson iteration to find roots in a complex plane using functions that students pick out themselves. And then when we run a little online competition, um, this year, MATLAB picked up a tweet that I did of um, some of the winners of our competition. And over 10,000 people saw that on the internet because the submissions were really beautiful. We write um, programs that do like very classical jobs in numerical analysis, like solving linear systems of equations and solving initial value problems and boundary value problems. But we also play card games and we run solitaire simulations and we generate fractal based art. Um, this example in the bottom left is called a highway dragon. And it's a recursive um, pattern that you can generate very large scale structures that are all geometrically self-similar at increasingly smaller and smaller length scales. So you learn how to do all of these kinds of simulations that build your ability to use built-in tools in MATLAB and also to um, get uh, stronger in your ability to solve open-ended problems. And uh, the picture on the right, the animation, is um, a double pendulum. And so we did this one and then used the dynamics of the double pendulum to create this kind of swirling piece of art that represents an important key parameter in the dynamics of this like classical mechanical system. So in terms of applications, um, my research group uses numerical analysis. Sorry, I don't know why this uh, screen is frozen. Okay, here we go. So this is uh, just some examples of things that we do. All of my students, their pictures are in the top right. All of my students have taken ME 413 and then we use that stuff on a daily basis. We carry out predictive simulations of the time course of bone healing. We do things where we um, reconstruct bone fractures. We put them back together and we simulate mechanical loading on them. All of this requires high level numerical computing abilities. We use curve fitting functions. So there are a ton of things that my students who take 413 learn that they carry forward with them that help them in the other classes they take in the graduate program and then also in the research that they do, which could be on any topic. But once you build up your confidence for being able to do numerical computing, it's a really, really um, exciting tool to have in your back pocket. So um, if you have questions for me on that particular course, uh, feel free to get in touch. The QR code in the bottom right hand of the screen is my lab Twitter. So you find updates there about the stuff that my students do that I'm so proud of and also things from my course, including um, ME413. Thank you, Professor Daly. Um, maybe you can also respond to a couple of additional points here. Uh, do students work in teams or groups or independently uh, in your research group? Uh, maybe you really talked about that, but I just wanna bring that forward as a point. Do you wanna to respond to that? Yeah, sure. So in my research group, it's all team-based research. So students have projects that they lead on their own, but we also do things collaboratively. So each of my PhD students has a project that they own that's theirs, but then they have additional projects that they work on in small sub teams. And so some of the things that we do are just too big and too complicated for one person to tackle on their own. So that collaboration is really important. And I think that that's something that you will find in all the graduate classes at Lehigh. There's a really strong element of peer-to-peer um, -peer learning. I'll give you examples from ME413. So when we get to meet in person, not in COVID, but when we have classes where we're in a room together, um, I have in-class exercises where I ask students to solve puzzles where they're doing them together side by side with the students sitting next to them. And that helps to build our ability to converse together in English about the, um, the things that we are learning and also build that sense that um, different perspectives are really important for solving hard problems. And so you may not be able to do it all on your own, but if you put your head together with the person next to you, the way that we do when we do research, you can tackle things that you didn't know how to solve on your own. Thank you. And I just maybe have an additional follow-up um, comment here. Um, the techniques that are learned in this entry-level numerical methods course, those are valuable for all of the types of research and the research clusters in mechanical engineering. In other words, no matter what discipline of mechanical engineering you go into, um, controls and robotics, robotics and animation, uh, fluid flow, flow structure interaction, and the other research clusters I indicated, um, a strong capability in what we call computational approaches 
or computer-based approaches is very valuable and uh, will be uh, very helpful as you uh, go to your next position beyond Lehigh. So I just wanted to point out that uh, what we're talking about here for the biomechanics can actually be generalized into these other important research clusters. Is that correct, Professor Daly? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have some students. They come back to me later and they say, this course was so helpful because then I learned how to use MATLAB and I needed that for you know, heat and match transfer or advanced dynamics. Those are their other courses. Or I needed that when I took experimental data and I didn't know how to process it. And so I had to write my own code to do that. Like this, these are really important skills that we as you know, working engineers, whether it's academia or in industry, we, we do these kinds of jobs all the time. And so if you have confidence to be able to do it, that can really help you to dive into a new project, uh, whether it's at the graduate research level or whether it's in your first job after your master's degree. Okay, thank you, Andy. Uh, Professor Banerjee, a uh, question for you. Uh, concerning your research program, do you supervise MS students that do a project or thesis in addition to PhD students? Uh, well, thank you, Professor Rockwell. So let me uh, respond to that. Yeah, and you know, maybe I will also try to respond to some of the comments or questions that I'm seeing on the chat, you know, as, as I go through a re direct response to you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, students coming into my program, uh, you know, I have a, a good mix of master's uh, students and they are at different levels. Uh, so, you know, some of my master's students who are actually funded by my research program, uh, they go on to write a master's thesis. Uh, and, you know, most of these students are, uh, you know, I've Id identified them while they are doing their undergraduate here at Lehigh. Uh, there's a I think there's very few that I have had here at Lehigh who I have personally recruited uh, from an external institution and brought in as a master's student. So most of my recruits from outside has been folks who have already had a master's degree and they've come here for a PhD program. Now the master's students here are on, uh, you know, at least in my group are on two different tracks. So the ones that are funded, uh, they actually end up writing a master's thesis and they end up staying for approximately two years. Uh, the ones that are not funded, they have the option of not writing a master's thesis, but just doing working on a master's project. Uh, and uh, you know, sometimes they are supported, uh, you know, maybe uh, partially in a semester. Sometimes I do recommend them for things like a partial teaching support, teaching assistantship, or a DGA. Now, uh, there are many uh, different layers of support that you can get. And again, uh, you know, uh, it's, it, it is dependent on your interest, the research program that is out there, and also, you know, what you want to do. So I, I just want to mention one thing. I've had a couple of students, so I know Chris is here, and Chris was an undergraduate research assistant in my group, uh, chose to do master's in a separate program. And then during his master's, he came to me and he asked me, you know, what he should do. And I told him, you need to go get a job, you know, work in industry, make up your mind and come back and do a PhD only if you want to. And the reason I say that is, uh, you know, for students who are completing their bachelor's, PhD is a long term, uh, you know, uh, commitment. And so you have to be very clear in your mind that you are willing to spend that time on a research program. Uh, now, having said that, uh, you know, most of my master's students uh, have come to me. I have not identified them. Uh, and, you know, they have, uh, they have uh, you know, they have been recruited by some of my PhD students uh, and they have worked very closely uh, with some of my PhD students on projects. And, uh, you know, some of them, I would say, have gone on to write first author journal publications I typically encourage them to attend uh, conferences because you know it does not matter if you're a master's student or a PhD student. I'm fully committed to your professional development, and so you know you would be encouraged to go to those conferences. So again, it depends on individual faculty members as to how they handle uh, the master's program. So, Professor Banerjee, thanks very much indeed for your insight. Um, I'd like to move now to uh, graduate student Ankit Roy. And so Ankit, the question I have for you, since your arrival at Lehigh from your home country, have the university, the 
mechanical engineering faculty or members of your research group been supportive and in what way? Would you like to respond? Thank you, Professor Rockwell. Um, I would like to say that Lehigh has a relatively small community, but it is a very close and amicable community. And I was able to develop relationships with my professors uh, really well at a personal level. I used to approach them with my research problems. Even though they weren't supervising my research directly, they would give it a thought and give me suggestions how to go about it. And um, when I first started my research, my advisor, Professor Ganesh Balasubramanian, he gave me papers that were relevant to my research. He down-selected papers and gave me the most useful ones. And since in Lehigh, we have a room for collaboration with other teams, other research groups, I was able to collaborate with Professor Brandon Crick's group and also with uh, Professor uh, Rickman in the material science department. So with these few collaborations, I was able to get some papers published. So there is room for cooperation in research and um, there's a very friendly ambience which facilitates efficient research. You will never feel that you have to carry out your research all by yourself. There is support from everywhere that you need. Um, well, yeah, so apart from that, the academic courses were very helpful for me. I was able to learn new techniques like machine learning and new computational techniques like molecular dynamics under in some of my courses. And these are relatively novel techniques that are occupying most areas of research. Um, so the courses are very um, customized to meet research requirements. So that's a great advantage of being a research student at Lehigh. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Akit. Um, I know you have more to say uh, with regard to your current research project, but we are getting close to the uh, timeline for the session. So I must apologize if we can please move on to uh, Emma Hillman. And uh, Emma, the question I have for you is, in addition to courses that are associated with the core mechanical engineering curriculum, what courses did you take outside the department and why? Hi, so um, I mostly focused on thermo heat transfer courses for my core mechanical engineering courses. But outside of that, um, as I said before, I was very interested in the energy industry um, and the power industry. So I looked for courses outside of the MECI department. One was an electrical engineering course, a special topics one called smarts, smart, grid, um, smart Grid Networks and Communication Networks. So I took that because I wanted to learn more about um, the electric utility industry um, and quite literally how power is delivered, um, is both generated and then delivered to um, like industrial buildings and homes. Um, so um, it was really great, even though I'm not like an electrical engineer, the professor was very helpful. Um, we did do some like problem solving things that maybe I didn't necessarily have the electrical engineering background in, but she was able to and um, give me like the specific information that I really needed to actually be able to solve these problems. So even though I didn't know everything about electrical engineering, I learned what I needed to, to be able to complete the coursework. Um, and now I'm actually working with this professor on a research project with the Institute for Cyber Physical Infrastructure and Energy, um, which is like an interdisciplinary um, program. And the, uh, I guess it's like a bunch of different um, the like colleges work on that uh, together. Another course I took too, so this was outside of the College of Engineering was Advanced Environmental Policy. So this also deals with the energy industry too. I particular, in particular, I learned a lot about um, like law and a lot of different environmental policies. But throughout that course, my professor was also really great. She made sure I was able to work on a research project and topic that related to policy in the electric utility industry. So then I was able to relate it back to um, like my interest in mechanical engineering and the energy industry. So even though I was able to learn all of these different topics and gain different perspectives from different departments and even different colleges, I was able to make it all relate back to my interest in mechanical engineering. Well, thank you very much indeed, Emma. And if we have time, we'll come back uh, maybe with some follow-up questions. Very helpful response. 
Christopher Rule, a uh, question I have for you. Do you feel that your teaching practicum, which you recently completed, has enhanced your management and leadership skills? Would you like to comment on that? Absolutely. Thank you, Professor. Um, as Professor Rockrell just mentioned, and I believe Ankit mentioned uh, earlier, uh, one of the experiences I had this past semester was a teaching practicum where uh, I was uh, intensely involved in the uh, creation and execution of an undergraduate course as an instructor um, for the semester. And last semester was rather unique with uh, it being all virtual, all online because of, of COVID. And the course that I was instructing was a senior level laboratory course for mechanical engineers, which added another level of uh, challenge to it. When you think of a mechanical engineering laboratory, you think of uh, students in person using their hands, taking apart things and seeing how they work. So uh, formulating that course in an online matter was, was a challenge, but I certainly learned a lot from it. Um, and one thing that I'll add in terms of how that helped me build my skills, uh, it's, it's one thing to learn a subject material in a classroom. It's another thing to apply it. But I really found this past semester that in order to truly internalize subject matter, um, teaching it is one of the best ways to do that. So this particular course was in the area of thermodynamics, which uh, is not my direct area of research. My area of research is more on the, the fluids mechanics side. And uh, I'll say that uh, leaving that experience this semester, I now feel that I have uh, expert level knowledge on, on the specific laboratories that were run simply because I was, I was put and challenged with the position to uh, instruct undergraduate students on that material. So it was a fantastic experience. I'm glad that I, I was given that experience. And it also exposed me to potentially what a, a future in academia could look like. So it was a, a, an experience that I learned a lot from it and highly recommend. Thanks, Chris. So just a follow up, would you be interested in mentoring an MS student on a research project or generally providing guidance on course selection, academic matters to an MS or beginning PhD student? Absolutely, I, I would love to help there. I think, especially with uh, my experience, six and a half years at Lehigh and in mechanical engineering, uh, I think I've been here as long as some of the faculty members here. So I certainly know uh, the ins and outs and uh, the, the you know, sometimes a more personal relationship with some of these faculty. So I, I would be more than happy to help with things like that. Okay, well, thanks very much, Chris. Um, we have reached uh, our point of uh, 9.30. In fact, it's 9.33 right now. So um, the members of the panel, the student and faculty members of the panel have kindly agreed to stay on. For those of you who would like to continue with us, I know some of you may have other meetings or commitments coming up. Very understandable if you'd like to sign off at this point. Uh, in case you do have to leave, I want to make it very clear that if your question was not answered today, please let us know by email and either myself or Ali or a member of our team here will get back to you as soon as possible. So with that in mind, um, maybe we can just um, continue with, with Chris, as long as you're on the screen here. Um, I have a question regarding your research, and perhaps you haven't gotten this far in your research, but do you have any plans to interact with industrial firms or government agencies outside of Lehigh that would be interested in your research project? Sure, thank you for the question, Professor. Um, that is something that I'm currently involved with. Uh, as we speak, I'm, I'm wrapping up an internship with an industry partner that has worked with our research lab for a little while now. And uh, that is also, has been a, a very unique experience. Um, sometimes in the realm of academia, I know we can uh, kind of put the blinders on with our particular research and not see the big picture of how our research is then applied in the real world. Uh, working with this industry partner uh, has showed me why what we're doing in our lab is important and how it can apply to 
uh, real world situation. So that's something that I really enjoyed doing for the past six months. And I hope I have the opportunity to continue working with uh, industry partners or government uh, partners uh, in the future. Thank you, Chris. Do any of the panelists uh, have any additional remarks they would like to make at this point? Um, I appreciate very much uh, your comments and insight you've offered so far. Anybody have any further points? Okay, um, Ali, um, do you have some questions that would be answerable in a short time frame here? Um, perhaps you could uh, read whatever questions you might have. It looks the, as though we've gotten through most of them between, um, thank you to Professor Daly and Chris for answering questions along the way. Um, I'm just looking through, there were a bunch. I did have one come in. Let's see. One question came in, um, I can't find it, but a question came in that would contacting faculty members increase your chance of admission? So the question is, contacting faculty members, would that increase your chance of admission? Being admitted, yes. Okay, well, of course, in the end, we have to go by our established criteria that represent quality, you know, high achievement in your previous record, undergraduate or perhaps a master's degree elsewhere. So um, we do have our established criteria and we have to apply those criteria uniformly for all applicants to our program. However, what can be helpful is from the financial aid standpoint, if you would like to contact a faculty member and ask what research projects might be available or potentially become available in the near future, that is helpful insight. Okay. Any other question, Ali, out there? Okay, I would like to um, basically uh, return to some of our panelists here. And uh, Emma, uh, for those uh, students who are planning to start the master's program or who are anticipating starting the master's program, um, would you please indicate whether you were able to reserve courses that you took while an undergraduate at Lehigh towards completion of the requirements for the MS degree? And this probably applies more appropriately to students who are presently sophomores and juniors, more or less planning their programs, but we can get the word out that reserving courses is a possibility. Would you like to comment on that, Emma? Sure. Um... So yeah, I was able to take some courses in addition to my undergraduate courses um, for graduate school at Lehigh. So I was planning on going to graduate school at Lehigh for probably since like sophomore or junior year. So it definitely helped. I was able to plan in advance. Um, but even senior year, I took a couple of um, Mechie graduate level, well, courses that I counted for the graduate level. So. Basically what I did was I was able to take three 300 level mechanical engineering courses, some during my junior year and my senior year. And um, those did not count at all towards my undergraduate degree. They were completely separate. And then I was able to transfer those credits directly to my graduate school degree. You just have to fill out a couple of forms. Um, you can talk to Allie and Professor Rockwell about figuring out those specifics and making sure you get the signatures. Um, but you can, I, I believe it is up to three courses. You could do less than three courses too, but you're definitely able to do that. And I highly recommend it if you're um, like me and want to get some of the courses, um, you have some extra room in your undergraduate degree because now I'm actually able to graduate, graduate with my mechanical engineering master's degree in just one year. Um, so that's great for me. I wasn't looking to do research necessarily, like um, do like a thesis. Um, I was more interested in working in industry pretty soon after I graduated. So now I'm able to do this in one year and it's been really great with my um, 
my plans for after graduation and also during grad school. Thank you, Emma. Professor Rockwell, we did have another question come in. Sure. Chris Rule, what is what was your journey like returning to Lehigh for your PhD, going into industry, and then back to university? Did you already have your master's? Uh, thanks for that question. That's a fantastic question because I can talk about myself a little bit more. Uh, so <laughs> my uh, journey um, started with my undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering, and then I immediately received my master's in a slightly different program here at Lehigh. Uh, and then I did work in industry. I worked for the United States Army as a civilian engineer. Uh, and uh, that role itself, um, one of the reasons I took that role, I, I wasn't quite pursuing my passion. I was kind of following the motions of what uh, it seemed like society thought mechanical engineering should do. You, you get your degree and then you go out and find a role in mechanical engineering and build a career off of that. Uh, so I was following those steps and I realized I just wasn't quite um, enthusiastic about the work that I was doing. And uh, every day going into work, I, I thought about the things I, I was passionate about and the reasons I was drawn to mechanical engineering in the first place. And a lot of that centered around uh, research and the idea of exploring a field that has not yet been explored fully. Uh, and so a lot of roads there pointed back toward uh, returning to school. And I think I've had conversations with uh, all of the faculty on this particular chat uh, prior to uh, going into industry and also before I decided to return to return for my PhD. Uh, and some of the advice that I got from these faculty was exactly why I returned. Um, and I, I know, I remember a conversation I had with uh, Professor Harlow years ago before uh, I think I even pursued my master's. And he said, it's an interesting dilemma that students are faced with uh, when you do go into industry and you start making money for the first time in your life. Um, and that's a good feeling, especially as a younger student just graduating college uh, and needing to pay off some, some student loans. Uh, and it might be difficult to return to school once you go out and start making money and finishing work at five o'clock and being done from the day and not in the, li the lab or the library at, at 2 a.m. Um, so it might be difficult to return to that life. But for me, I knew that uh, I enjoyed those pursuits. I enjoyed that adventure the first time around when I was completing my master's and as an undergraduate student. So it was certainly something I was comfortable returning to. Uh, and that way I could also uh, get back into the area of research, which, which I did. And uh, the last thing I'll add, one of the reasons I, I did come back and the faculty on here will be too modest to, um, you know, to, to brag about themselves. But one of the reasons I chose to come back specifically to Lehigh was because of the faculty and the interactions that I had with them as an undergraduate, as a master's student, and then also while I was working with industry and still maintaining those relationships uh, and being able to jump on a phone call to hear their advice on what I should be doing with my career or, or potential movements. Uh, those were all the reasons that I decided to come back and specifically come back to, to Lehigh. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, another uh, set of questions that emerged uh, during the registration process uh, concerned international experience. And uh, perhaps I can address that. Um, the question was basically, is there a possibility of study abroad as a graduate student? Now, study abroad is typically associated with undergraduate programs. At Lehigh, we have a very dynamic study abroad program. For graduate students, it's more on an individualized basis between the faculty member in the US and a faculty member in another country. And you may recall the slide I showed that talked about international uh, scholarships or fellowships or awards for our students to uh, basically be at the major European uh, nuclear research center, CERN, and also the uh, major uh, biomechanical research center in Zurich, Switzerland. And in those cases, the students applied with the help of the faculty member, with strong support from the faculty, 
to get the research funding to spend time abroad. And I do know from personal experience how important that is. I've lived uh, over three and a half years uh, in Germany, and I'm very familiar with the German system. They do have something called in English, the German Academic Exchange Service, which is an opportunity for graduate students in the US to spend some time in Germany. So for those of you who are interested in that dimension of experiences as part of your graduate study, we would try to help you and provide whatever guidance we can. Well, um, we're approaching 9.45 and I think um, we should be tapering off at this point. What I'd like to do is just once again emphasize if your questions were not answered to the extent that you would like, actually all of us who have appeared today would be glad to uh, get back to you with a detailed response. I suggest that first of all, you write to myself and Ali, Alice in the Fierce uh, Marsteller, and we will basically uh, respond as quickly as we can. And finally, I'd like to make the general remark, you may have sensed perhaps during this uh, webinar that there is a, a strong team effort, a mutually supportive effort between our graduate students and our faculty. And uh, that's one of the reasons, quite frankly, that I've been at Lehigh for so long. It's such a delightful and stimulating environment. And if you are able to come here, which I hope you will be, uh, then you will have this experience, I'm very sure. So with that in mind, I'd like to uh, close the webinar and thank all of you for joining us. And we look forward to keeping in touch. So long. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for everything. You're welcome.